origin, the expanded labor supply. Well, notice that the impact of having an increase in the labor supply and no fundamental change in the demand for labor, right? The prices of the products haven't changed. We're holding those constant. There was no change in the marginal product of labor, that is the production function in shoes or the production function in food. We've just added more labor to the economy. So what happens then is we're going to see a lower wage in both industries. And then we will get a new allocation of labor with an increase in the labor supply in both industries. Okay. So the labor that comes in is going to be allocated to both industries. How it's allocated, we don't actually know. It depends upon what the slopes of these marginal product of labor curves look like. That is what the demand curves look like. So we, but we know that if you've got more workers coming in, remember we assume labor was neutral, so it's going to, go to end up going to both industries. But that additional labor, right, if we increase the supply, shift the supply curve out, the equilibrium real wage should decline. <coughs> They only, they, but they only stay the same where they cross. Right? Well, the slope, the slope here and the slope here are the same. But that's not necessarily the same. And the slope here and the slope here will be the same. But that doesn't mean that these two slopes will be the same. I mean, so, I don't want to draw it there. Suppose I had drawn one like that and one like that. That would be perfectly possible. And now when I shift, notice if I pull this out, almost all the workers are going to actually end up going to whatever industry this is. No. Because if, if we pull this out this way, Right? I'm just sending the flat portion out, and we're still going to end up way out here, and more of the workers will be in what is that, the shoe industry. So the shapes of the, remember the shapes of the demand for labor curves depend upon what the production functions look like. And so unless I know something a lot more about what the production functions look like, I can't make any definitive statements about how this allocation of labor compares to this allocation of labor. Yes? No, the other resources are fixed, right? Right? Yes. No, the shift in this curve is not because the marginal product of labor shifted. Okay. The movement in this curve is because we move the whole axis over. So here, what we have at this, at this wage rate, right here, we have to have the same distance over here. Because at this wage rate, this tells us that this is the demand for labor, but we've got a much larger labor supply. So if we're moving this over x units, this whole demand for labor curve also has to move over x units. So this is moving not because there's a change in the price, not because there's a change in the marginal product of labor, but it's moving because there's a change in the labor supply. Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. Yes, it is true that the marginal product of labor declines because we have more workers, right? So if you thought about a production function with diminishing returns, as you increase the number of workers, you'll be moving up the production function, but it'll be getting flatter and flatter. Well, we can see that here as we're moving down along this curve. Our prices are fixed, so the decline movement down along has to be because we have a lowered marginal product of labor. Yes? <laughs> this has nothing to do with the problem set. That was from the previous model. Uh huh. Right, right. Oh, sure. You know, as we said when, way back when we uh, talked about the hecksher olden model, remember when we talked about the bully box? One of the things that we said is, yeah, we can raise the roof when we increase capital, we can lower the floor, we can do some of both. So it doesn't matter whether we increase this to the right, pull it out to the left, or do some of each. Analytically, in graphic, drawing your graphs, it's much cleaner if you only make one move, right? Which is, I don't want to write, okay, this is part of the immigration, and this is part of the migration over here. It's just easier to put it all in one spot, then I only have to shift one curve. But notice, regardless of how you stretch out the horizontal axis, the because you have diminishing marginal product of labor in both industries, you will have that intersection point at a lower nominal wage. If you increase the supply of labor relative to the demand for labor, the wage rate should decline. And that's, what that's all that this is really showing. Right? We've increased the labor supply, and the demand for labor are actually exactly the same. Okay, so what else do we need? Okay. So, any other questions about this? Oh, no, shock. Now, what happens in Poland? Okay, so we're losing workers in Poland, right? So we have to have the amount of immigration, which means that this axis has moved in, which means that this demand for labor curve also has to shift over. And notice, with less, with fewer workers, with the same amount of capital and land, the marginal product of labor will increase. And in Poland, wages will be higher. Will the two wage rates equalize? What do you think? Will wage rates equalize? Well, in the long run, right, where if labor is truly mobile, only responding to economic incentives, that is, if workers are moving between countries only because of economic returns, not social, cultural, you know, any of the other kinds of things that can take place uh, in labor markets, and over <clears throat> long periods of time, and there's no cost associated with migration, which, by the way, there is, tells us that in the long run, we should see uh, wage rates uh, equalize across countries. 
what we can say at this point is that we have convergence. We should start to see some convergence of wage rates across countries because of labor migration. Notice that we also had convergence of wage rates across countries uh, between labor abundant and capital abundant countries inside the Hector Olin model. Okay, so what do we have here? Okay, so again, also notice that the allocation, the um, labor will actually decline in both industries. Right? So when workers leave Poland, we will see some of the workers coming out of the shoe industry, and some of those workers will have come out of the food industry. In yeah, a way, we go. So, so now we want to ask ourselves, what happens to the return to capital, and what happens to the return to land? <coughs> now, in both cases, we've got fixed resources, and we've got diminishing returns Diminishing returns to land, and we have diminishing returns to capital. So that then determines our initial rates of return to land and uh, the land and capital. Now, I did not intend to show that the return to capital and the return to land are at the same level. So that's the axes could be different or something else. It just <coughs> happens stamps that came out that way. Okay, yes? Uh, we could. It gets messy after a while. Huh? Okay. But well, let's work this out first, okay? Yeah. Right. Both industries would increase, unless you had something very peculiar in terms of the production function. That is, that what you would have to have is that one of your production functions would have to go absolutely flat. So, it, so the marginal product of labor would go to zero, kind of like what I drew over here. Do you have a question? No? Okay. Yes? Oh, yeah, no, we are. Okay, I thought there were some questions down here. We were just trying to get those out of the way. So this is Ireland, right? That's Ireland up there. We'll keep this to the Ireland. So what happens in Ireland? What happens in the, to the return to capital? How come? Okay, so we've got a fixed amount of capital, but we've got more workers now in the shoe industry, which is capital intensive. So more workers on a fixed amount of capital would increase the marginal product of capital. So even though the price of the shoe stays the same, the value of the marginal product of capital goes up, and what we should see is a higher return to capital. Yes? Um, I don't understand how, um, I follow up with decreasing marginal product, but I don't understand how this picture shows up, but earlier you said things in the long term with the change in marginal product, but how this case is not even the long term, it's just the Okay, so there's a difference. So up here, we change the amount of labor. So what we want to think about is what a production function looks like. Okay? So when we're talking about shoes, we have the quantity of shoes here. And when we're talking about this guy, our labor supply, we have the amount of labor on the horizontal axis. So our production function looks like that. When we change the amount of labor, we're simply moving along this axis, which is moving us up or down along the production function. The slope is changing as we move up or down. In this case, we were increasing the labor supply. So the slope of the production function is becoming flatter and flatter. Well, that's, what, that's this movement here. So we haven't, we haven't changed this. Now, what would cause this to shift up or to shift down? Okay, so what causes this particular production function to shift up or down would then be any of the other factors of production that are used in shoes with the exception of labor, right? Any, change, any of those factors of production. Now, let's think about why this marginal product curve shifts. When we want to talk about the marginal product of capital, now we want to put capital on the horizontal axis. We want to think about the relationship between output of shoes and the capital used in shoe production. Now, remember, we're assuming we have diminishing marginal product of capital. So we're still talking about how, much, how many shoes can we produce at various different levels of capital. If the amount of capital was changing, we'd be moving along this horizontal axis and up and down the production function, and the slope would be changing. So in that case, we'd be changing the absolute amount of capital that we have. This would be shifting left or right, and we would move up or down the marginal product of capital curve. But here, what shifts this up or down is, again, any of the factors of production that are important for shoes other than capital. <coughs> and the factor of production other than capital that changed was the amount of labor that we have. So that's why we get a shift here, but only a movement along the marginal product curve in the labor market. Decrease. So, right, right. Uh, well, we would. Well, first of all, no profit maximizing firm would do that, right? You wouldn't add labor if you were going to get less output because that would reduce your revenues. So, you wouldn't be a profit maximizing firm, right? So, you have a couple of, a couple of options there. One is you can uh, change your production mix, right? That is, you can change the capital to labor ratio, which you might or might not be able to do. So, if you can't do that, then you end up not using all the labor resources, at least not in the production of shoes. And they end up going somewhere else. Uh, is there a parallel shift up? Oh, close enough to one. Probably not. That's right. That was one of our assumptions, actually, to start with, is that there are no changes in, or that the, both the prices of both are constant. 
Okay. Okay, so capital owners, they seem to be happy. Now, what happens to the return to land? It's exactly the same, right? It's still a fixed factor of production in terms of, in this case, food. We've got more workers, so to the extent that we can increase the labor-to-land ratio, we should see an increase in the value of the marginal product of land and food production, and that should increase the rate of return in land. <coughs> Now, what do you suppose happens in Poland to the return to capital and the return to land? Just the opposite, right? So what we see then is when we have labor mobility between countries, the country that experiences immigration, taking new workers in, will generally see the nominal wage fall, but there will be increases in the return to the owners of capital and return to the owners of land. That is, the specific factors whose size has not changed. Meanwhile, you have just the opposite effect on the country that's experiencing emigration and sending workers out. With a smaller labor force, it's going to drive their nominal wages up, but with fewer workers on any given uh, stock of capital or any given stock of land, the rate of return, the marginal product of both capital and land will fall. So the rate of return on ca uh, to the capital owners and the rate of return to the landowners will both decline. So it might tell you something, a little something, about what's, uh, it might tell you something about what's happening to, or what, who the parties are, generally speaking, from an econ again, from an economic perspective, who the parties are that are for immigration or against immigration, both in the receiving country as well as in the sending country. Now, let's also think about what happens to industry output. Industry output. So let's put a quantity of shoes and a quantity of food. We've got a production possibilities curve, or production possibilities frontier. We've got our ISO value line with the slope that equals the relative price. And so this tells us, before immigration, what our output of shoes is and what our output of food is. Now, because of our assumption that labor is neutral, when we increase the labor supply, the production possibilities frontier is going to shift out, but there won't be any particular bias to that shift. And so with the same relative price, an assumption, by the way, that we made, what we should see is an increase in the quantity of shoes and an increase in the quantity of food. So Ireland's got more workers, and the those more workers are obviously, some are going to go to each industry, which is what we can see up here, and that allows the output in both industries to increase. Poland, of course, will have just the opposite situation, where the production possibilities curve will shift in, and that inward shift of the production possibilities curve, just think about the reverse, same relative prices, we're going to get a decline in the economic uh, we're going to get a decline in the output of both goods and services, or both, both goods, shoes and food. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Now, the next question is, what happens to world output? What happens to world output? Let's see, I need one more board. I need a new board. Okay, so for world output, we want to think about a big box like this, where this is the total world labor force. Okay? So this is a combination of Ireland's labor force and Poland's labor force. So we're not worried about where they are. Now, what we want to put on the vertical axis is slightly different, though. Now we want the marginal product of labor in Ireland. And on the right vertical axis, we want the marginal product of labor in Poland. Now, Remember, the value of the marginal product of labor is equal to the price of the product times the marginal product of labor in that industry, which we know in equilibrium is also going to be equal to the real wage. Well, we can divide through by the price level. The wage rate divided by the price level gives us the real wage, call that a little w, lowercase w. And this equals simply the marginal product of labor up here. Okay. So that's what we're putting on the axes over here, is just the marginal product of labor. So at this point, we don't have to worry about what's happening to prices. Just want to look at the marginal product of labor. Well, we already know that, because of our assumption of diminishing marginal returns to the factors of production, that the <coughs> marginal product of labor in Ireland will be downward sloping, and the marginal product of labor in Poland will be downward sloping, but from the, the right-hand axis. So where is, before immigration, 